Good morning. Welcome in the name of our Savior Jesus to worship here at Living Shepherd. It's a joy to gather together with you this morning, especially on this Sunday. This is actually the last Sunday of our church year. So we have a church year calendar where we observe special festivals, special seasons. And this is the last Sunday. In it. And on this last Sunday, we go back to something that we're reminded of week to week, but really comes into clear focus on this day. Jesus Christ is our King. What does that mean? Well, that will be the focus for our worship this morning. We'll see how Jesus is our righteousness. May God bless your worship this morning. We are especially blessed this morning to have Pastor Wayne Uhlhorn, who was our synod, one of our Synod's mission counselors. He'll be here to share God's word with us. Um, so we thank him for coming and preaching this morning. Uh, we want to welcome all of those who are joining us online this morning. We're so glad that you're with us. If you are worshiping online this morning, we'd love it if you would just leave a comment, even if that comment is just your name. It's good for us to know who's gathered together with us, and it's good for us to know, too, how we can serve you better. If you're looking for our worship folder, you can find that on our church website, livingshepherd.com. If you go to the Alive and Growing tab, you'll see a heading there for worship. If you click on that, you'll find a button where you can download this worship folder. May God bless your worship this morning as we begin with our opening hymn, hymn 344. We'll sing verses 1 and 5 together to start off with, At the Name of Jesus. Please stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins to God our Father, asking Him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins. And trusting in my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us and has given His only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by His authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In the peace of this forgiveness, let us praise the Lord.
The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, by your victory you have broken the power of the evil one. Fill our hearts with joy and peace as we look with hope to that day when every creature in heaven and earth will acclaim you King of kings and Lord of lords to your unending praise and glory. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. Our first scripture reading this morning is from Revelation chapter 1, verses 4 through 8. Here we are reminded a little bit more of what it means that Christ is our King. It means that He is true God from eternity. But it also means that He is true God, true man, the perfect Savior who won salvation for us. This King is the one who will return again to take us home. Revelation chapter 1, verses 4 through 8. Grace and peace to you from Him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits before His throne, and from Jesus Christ who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead and the ruler of the kings of the earth, to Him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by His blood, and has made us to be a kingdom and priests to serve his God and Father. To him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Look, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And all the peoples of the earth will mourn because of him. So shall it be. Amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. This is the word of our God. Our psalm for the day is actually in the form of a hymn, and it's printed for you on page 15. Lift high the name of Jesus.
Out of respect for the words and works of Christ, please stand for the reading of the gospel. The gospel for this Sunday is from John chapter 18, verses 33 through 37. Here we see what it means that Jesus is our king. He is the one who gave himself up for us. Pilate then went back inside the palace, summoned Jesus, and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Is that your own idea, Jesus asked, or did others talk to you about me? Am I a Jew, Pilate replied? It was your people and your chief priests who handed you over to me. What is it you have done? Jesus said, My kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jews. But now my kingdom is from another place. You are a king then, said Pilate. Jesus answered, You are right in saying I am a king. In fact, for this reason I was born, and for this I came into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. This is the gospel of our Lord. You may be seated. Our next hymn is printed for you on pages 6 and 7. Crown him with many crowns, hymn 341. and peace to you in Christ Jesus. The word of God for our sermon this morning is from the Old Testament prophet Jeremiah, chapter 33, beginning at verse 14. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will fulfill the gracious promise I made to the house of Israel and to the house of Judah. In those days and at that time, I will make a righteous branch sprout from David's line. He will do what is right and just in the land. In those days, Judah will be saved and Jerusalem will live in safety. 
This is the name by which it will be called, the Lord our righteousness. For this is what the Lord says, David will never fail to have a man sit on the throne of the house of Israel, nor will the priests who are the Levites ever fail to have a man to stand before me continually to offer burnt offerings, to burn grain offerings, and to present sacrifices. This is the word of the Lord. And dear friends in Christ, you know how sometimes you will hear people say, oh, that reminds me of, of a scene out of the movie Deliverance. Now, maybe they've never even seen the movie, but there's, there's something about where they've arrived, where they're traveling to, something spooky, something eerie that causes them to say, well, this reminds me of, of Deliverance. And, and, and everybody, again, even if you've never seen the movie, understands and recognizes the music to to the dueling banjos. Well, one night, I actually watched the movie Deliverance. It's such a part of pop culture. It's it's, uh, so well known. People quote it even though they've They've, they've maybe never seen it. I, it was on late night television, some obscure cable channel, and I, and I thought, I'm, I'm going to watch it. And it kind of freaked me out. It, it was scary. It was disturbing, and I'm not sure why it's called deliverance. You and I do, however, know why we have been delivered, how we've been delivered. We, we recognize That word, delivered, the Lord is our deliverer. But in case we sometimes get a little mixed up about what kind of a deliverer we have, what kind of a a king is actually ruling right now, what kind of a kingdom we are to be a part of, and, and what we've been delivered from, and what we've been delivered for, and what it means in the future, and what it means right now, We're going to take a look at the prophet Jeremiah's words this morning, and we're going to see exactly what kind of a a king that we have, and we'll see that king is the right kind of king that we need, who provides the right kind of deliverance that we need, because he is the Lord, our righteousness. Like I said, we're going to, to do this by looking at the prophet Jeremiah, and you know, That's a pretty scary thing to to read as well. Jeremiah is sometimes called the weeping prophet. He wrote the book of Lamentations where he laments the punishment that God brought down on his people. And and, and here in the the book of Jeremiah, he brings a, a personal aspect that none of the other prophets do his personal feelings about what's gone on with the people of God, how far they've drifted from him and what punishment is in store for them. And he did this for 41 years. Now, Pastor Adam, second career man, started here a little bit later. If you're here 41 years, I don't want to you know, guess how old that would make you, but But sometimes pastors spend their whole ministry in one congregation and they minister to maybe even three generations of people. But Jeremiah wasn't the pastor of a congregation so much as he was a prophet called to speak God's word to a nation. And this nation had was the the chosen people of God, but had really fall far away from God. And maybe you would say, well, I recognize a nation like that. Because this was a nation that, that had all the promises of God, all the privileges of God, but they began to elect their own kings who became self-serving, and then they followed suit, and they pursued pleasure, and they forgot about God's commands, and they, and they forgot about the, the God who loved them and, and promised them uh, all sorts of blessings in life and, and in eternity, and they, they forgot the love of God, and then they ignored the laws of God. And Isaiah and Jeremiah was called 
to proclaim to them, this is what is in store for you if you do not repent. There were five different basic things that, that God had Jeremiah say to this people of God that had fallen away from God. One of them was repent, turn from your evil ways, return to the Lord. The second thing was, here's what's going to happen to you if you don't return to the Lord. Judgment will come upon you. Another nation will swallow you up. Be prepared for that if you do not return and repent to the Lord. Number three, a, a message that to all the survivors after, after the punishment came, see, this, this happened to them. Don't let it happen to you and your generation. The fourth thing was a, a message to all, all the believers who stayed true to the Lord and wondered, what's going on? We're losing our nation. The, the heathens have taken over. It was a message to, to let them know this is how God works. And then finally, it, it was a message of promise, of restoration, of hope from the Lord, again to God's faithful who remained true to him. One more little paragraph of, of background so that we understand a little bit about the context of this promise Jeremiah was called to be a prophet in the year 627 B.C. And for 20 years, he preached those messages that I just mentioned. Repent, return to the Lord, judgment is coming if you don't. At the end of those 20 years, the, the Babylonians, with King Nebuchadnezzar, took over the nation of Judah. And that's when they deported you know, the brightest and the best, the, the smartest, most talented people, and, and brought them to live as expatriates and, and, and serve the, the government of their enemy. And you know some of the people that, that, that were deported up there. Daniel and, and the three men that were in the fiery furnace. That all took place up in, up in Babylon. We call it the Babylonian captivity. God's people were taken captive and, and in some cases brought up to that land. Seven years after that happened, King Nebuchadnezzar also brought 3,000 more up there. And then three months after that was, was the final battle. And, and, and the, the city of Jerusalem destroyed the temple, left in ruins, 10,000 fighting troops and skilled artisans were, were all brought away from their hometown, away from their homeland to live in Babylon. And all that was left at the end of that was a war-torn city, a desperate people, the handicapped, the elderly, the poor, and the prophet Jeremiah. Now that's a scary scene. You know how a lot of TV shows and movies and video games feature some sort of zombie apocalypse right now? I mean, it, it's like everything has been destroyed. Mankind is left to, to scavenge on their own. Everyone is hunted and, and being and hunting. And, and it's almost as if the people write, that write these shows, who do not often believe in God, who have far abandoned the Bible, recognize something. The world can't just keep going like this. Th this has got to end somehow, and it's not going to end well. Well, they're right. The, the world cannot continue spiraling out of favor with God, ignoring him, it's, it's, it's bad enough. It's, it's going to get worse, and Jesus promised he's going to come again. Our, our king is also a judge who promises that he will one day judge the living and the dead. And so that is what we have to remember when we think about our king and what he's delivered us from. He's delivered us from hell. I know a lot of people think 
I don't want to talk about hell. I don't want to believe that there is a hell. I don't want to believe in a God who would send anyone to hell. But the scriptures are filled with a day of judgment. God will not be mocked. He's holy. And people will only get along so long ignoring his existence and rejecting his love. But our king has delivered us from the apocalypse. Our king has rescued us from everlasting condemnation and suffering. He's done it through his son, Jesus. And we're going to talk about Jesus, our king, our righteousness, a little bit more in a second. But when it comes to our king who is ruling at the end of time, we know that we will be delivered. There's another, another TV show that I probably shouldn't admit that I watch, so I won't na na name it, but it, it takes place in Montana on a really big ranch. <laughs> and, and recently, there, there was a showdown between the star of the show and, and kind of an evil man, and, and the gruff old uh, hero said, hey, it's me against you. Either you send me to heaven or I'll send you to hell. And I thought to myself, well, I don't know that that's where you'd go to heaven. I mean, he's not really a good man. And, and I think that whenever we hear about judgment and evil people and God's rescue, sometimes we fall into that category of thinking, yeah, they'll get theirs and, and we'll get ours. But it's important for us to remember that we, we've done nothing to deserve this kind of deliverance. We've, we've fallen short of, of what God expects of us, demands of us. We, we've done it in, in selfish actions. We've done it in angry words. We've done it in impure thoughts. We do it all the time. And I bring that up because that's what we call sin. Missing the mark of God's holy and perfect will, and every single one of us has fallen short of that. We've done it by the things we've said and done. We've done it by the things we have neglected to do out of pure laziness and selfishness. But we have a king who has also delivered us from our sins, from our trespasses, from our guilt. And that is the Lord, our righteousness. Listen again to these promises here that the prophet Jeremiah gives. And, and we're going to take a, just a tiny look at, at something that we'll be hearing a whole lot about in the, in the month of December in the season of Advent. All these promises of God of a Savior that was to come from David's line. Listen, listen here. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will fulfill the gracious promise I made to the house of Israel and to the house of Judah. In those days and at that time, I will make a righteous branch sprout from David's line. He will do what is just and right in the land. In those days... Judah will be saved and Jerusalem will live in safety. This is the name by which it will be called the Lord our righteousness. We, we hear that during Advent, right? Behold, a branch is growing. Something, some kind of life is coming from, from something that looked dead. A, a branch from David's line. An uh, an uh, uh, offspring of David, uh, a descendant of David is coming, and he's going to be the king, and he's going to rule, and he's going to deliver. But, but there's, there's more to this king than just a, a one-time ruler that's going to give a country a, a couple good decades, because we keep reading. For this is what the Lord says, David will never fail to have a man sit on the throne of the house of Israel. Nor will the priests who are the Levites ever fail to have a man to stand before me continually to offer burnt offerings, to burn grain offerings, and to present sacrifices. Never fail to have a man on the throne, continually offering up sacrifices. This is a king that's ruling more than just 
eight years or, or, or even 80 years, this is a king that rules forever. It, it, it's kind of an interesting thing when you, you take a deep dive into some of these prophecies, again, that we hear so often in the season of Advent. Listen to this one from Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1. A shoot will come up from the stamp, stump of Jesse. From his roots, a branch will bear fruit. Jesse was David's father. So again, from this looks like extinct line of kings, there's going to be a king. Uh, a, a shoot's going to rise up. But, but later in verse 10, that shoot, that branch, is described as the root. In that day, the root of Jesse will stand as a banner for the peoples. The nations will rally to him. How can you be a, ran a branch, but also a root? How can you be a descendant of David, but also David's ancestor? Unless you are eternal. Unless you're more than a man, you're also true God. And that's the king we have. Born of a woman, but born miraculously, conceived by the Holy Spirit. And that's the only way this king can be our righteousness, is if it's a man who lived on this earth and was perfect in our place. And, and that means pure in thought and mind. Never, his mind never wandered to all those dark places. His words were always encouraging, and, and his actions selfless and giving. And this, this is not just a man, though. This is true God who, who took our sins and did away with them on the cross and then put upon ourselves his righteousness. The Lord, our righteousness, means the Lord is righteous and he gives us righteousness. He gives us perfection. He gives us purity and that's how we know that we will be with him forever. We may think that the kind of kingdom we need here on earth is going to be the result of, of elections going the way we want them to, to go. We may think that as, as long as the king is, is living in the palace and the, and the flag is at full staff, we're safe, we're secure, we're going to be prosperous as a nation. But we can never put our trust in something so temporary and so human as an earthly kingdom. But when we put our trust in a king who has delivered us, who is our righteousness, who we know will reign forever and ever and ever, then we know we're a part of the right kingdom. Amen. Now may the peace of God which surpasses all understanding, may it guard and keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. And please stand. Uh, we turn to page 7 and we'll confess our faith according to the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made, for us and for our salvation. He came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the poor.
Let's go. Again, there we go. Let's sing the create in me. seated. At this time, we will gather our thank offering. There is an offering plate sitting on the small table in the back. If you're so moved, you may drop your offering in that plate at any time. If you're a guest or a visitor with us this morning, it's important that you understand you are not obligated to give an offering. We are simply happy to have you here and to share the Word of God with you. Your gifts and your offerings certainly are appreciated and welcomed, though, because this is one of the ways that we take this good news of Jesus, the Lord, our righteousness, out into our community. Also, during this time for the offering, we'd kindly ask that whether you're a guest with us, a visitor, a, a member of Living Shepherd, or just a friend of ours, we'd ask that everyone please sign the friendship registers that are located in the, the racks at the center chair of each row. This is one of the ways where we want to just make sure that we have information so that we can thank you for worshiping with us this morning. We continue now with the prayers that are printed for you on pages 9 and 10. At the place for special prayers will include my sister and her family. Um, She, her three kids, and her husband are all sick with COVID, so we'll ask the Lord to bless them and heal them. Please stand. To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. You are worthy, O Christ our King, to receive honor and glory and praise. For you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. You are worthy, O Christ our King, to receive honor and glory and praise because you were slain, and with your blood you purchased us for God. From every tribe and language and people and nation, You have called us into your kingdom and have made us priests to serve you, our God and Father. We give thanks to you, O Christ, our King, because you have searched for us and found us. Lead us to the green pastures and quiet waters of your saving love, so that we may enjoy peace and comfort for our souls. We give thanks to you, O Christ, our King, because you have taken your great power and have begun to reign. 
Come with your mighty power to break and defeat every evil plan and purpose of the devil, of the ungodly influences and ideas of the world, and of our own sinful nature. Use your power to calm the unrest among nations and peoples, so that your kingdom may spread and grow. O Christ our King, you have supremacy over all. You will judge the world in righteousness and the people with equity. You have destroyed death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Reign in our hearts that we may serve you faithfully and speak boldly to others of your saving love. Gracious God, we come before you on behalf of the Turner family who are suffering with COVID. Bless them all with health and healing and help them to recover quickly. Strengthen them especially to remember that they remain in your loving care at all times. Bless them so they continue to know your gracious promises fulfilled and centered in Christ and lead them all to a greater trust in how you use these difficulties for their eternal good. And hear us, Lord, as we bring you our private petitions. Look. He is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever, King of kings and Lord of lords. The Lord God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated. We continue now with the preparation for Lord's Supper. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good and right that we should at all times and in all places give you thanks, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Everlasting God. We praise you especially for the promise to preserve your church to the end of time when Christ will come again as King to judge all people and take his own to glory. Therefore, with all the saints on earth and hosts of heaven, we praise and bless your holy name. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it 
in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. God tells us in his word that when we receive Lord's Supper, we are receiving bread and wine as well as the body and blood of our Savior Jesus for the forgiveness of our sins. God also tells us in his word that when we commune together, we are in fact confessing agreement in faith and teaching with those with whom we commune. For this reason, we kindly ask that if you're a guest or a visitor with us and, haven't, and aren't a member of a congregation in fellowship with ours, that you kindly refrain from taking Lord's Supper at this time. Because this will give us the opportunity to study God's word together and to see what he says about this wonderful sacrament. And it will also keep you from being in the uncomfortable position of saying you agree with what our church teaches without first knowing what we teach. We'll again practice table distribution this morning. So what that means is we'll start on this side of the sanctuary. You're invited to come forward through the center aisle and line up here to receive Lord's Supper. After you receive it, you're welcome to return to your seats by the side aisle, and then we'll move to this side of the sanctuary. Come, for all things are now ready. body and blood of your Lord and Savior Jesus Christ will strengthen and preserve you and keep you in the one true faith until life everlasting. Go in peace. Your sins are forgiven.
We continue now with the prayer printed on the bottom of page 12. Please stand. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. We give thanks, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us with this holy supper and through your word. We pray that through these you will strengthen our faith in you and increase our love for one another. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Brothers and sisters, go in peace. Live in harmony with one another. Serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. You may be seated. Our closing hymn is printed for you on the following page. It's hymn 752, In Christ Alone. Good morning once again.